Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today we will be listening to the seventh part of what if Ruby and Weiss were childhood friends. If you enjoy, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing down below and don't forget to hit that bell icon so you get notified when videos go live. Now, without further ado, let's get into the video. Chapter 13, Turning Point Things have been tense between them the past few days since Ruby's save a kid from a burning building stunt and really, Weiss was glad she did, she was even proud of what she'd done. Her childhood friend had managed to save a life after all, so there was some part of her that agreed with her actions but her blatant disregard for own safety, risking her life like that. It terrified Weiss. The last few moments of seeing Ruby fall back first by her own deliberate choice. It was horrifying to witness it firsthand. Had Yang been a few seconds too late? She shudders at the thought. She could've. Ruby could've. Her spine would've been fragmented beyond repair. She would be paralyzed starting and ending from God knows where and that's if she wasn't in a coma, or dead. The other frightening part about it was that both of them, Ruby and Yang. Their childhood best friends. The dorks who have been nothing but sweet and affectionate towards them since they've gotten back. Acting like their old selves from when they were kids being carefree and having fun. Their mischievous blonde jock and her loving dolt. They were used to it. The way Ruby had climbed up, easily jumping from surface to surface. It wasn't a skill someone learned that easily. Something that could probably be achieved from years of practice and she did it with finesse, not making any mistakes, even the way she'd fallen was calculated. Yang too, the way she jumped, dashing for her sister and tackling both Ruby and the child in mid-air and landing perfectly like she'd done it thousands of times. They were too polished for moves a person would do in the middle of a crisis like that. Like they've done it dozens upon dozens of times and been through worse, far worse things than what they had told Blake and Weiss. And when they saw Ruby in the back of that ambulance, her eyes were far from the shining silver she was used to. It easily confirmed her suspicions that what she'd seen just a few moments before the fire happened was most definitely not a mirage. Her eyes were intense. Like the glint of a blade ready to kill someone. Ruby's eyes were stormy and cold. There were no traces of love and affection in that gaze, just pure unadulterated anger. When she saw the group though, she was back to her usual, if not a bit more worried self and when she held Weiss firmly, rubbing circles on her back to calm her down, it only left Weiss confused and scared. What could have caused her to end up like that? What else were they hiding? Was the story they told them the truth? They made it sound like it was a one-time happenstance. That after what happened, their uncle had taught them how to defend themselves, occasionally tagging along with him but staying behind the lines and that was the end of the story. What if they really had done more things, bad things like what Ruby had implied before? Could she really believe her sweet dolt, her Ruby Rose would be capable of such acts? Would she still accept them despite that? Despite the possibility that they weren't just simply one-time victims but evolved into predators, hunting people as they were hunted. Even though they were just kids, what else had they done? Weiss wanted to get to the bottom of everything but she herself wasn't even sure if she wanted to find out the truth. Would she still love Ruby despite everything? She had to find out, despite her fears. Weiss needed to learn the truth. And since their sleepover was coming up in a few days, that would be the perfect time to maybe do a little recon and maybe rope Blake in this truth scheme of hers in the process. She only hopes that her bad feelings simply remain just feelings. He takes a long drag of the cigarette wrapped around his fingers. The last lead he'd followed up was the most promising one he had. Which only meant one thing, that all the next ones he had were absolute busts. He should have engaged in a fight against that black clad figure and if he was successful, Crow would have been able to beat some information out of them. But something about that person seemed, off. Like the whole island, the person he'd seen seemed so, hollow like a robot following orders. What it means for the organization, he didn't know. And Crow was tired of not knowing. At least some part of him was relieved that his nieces were far away from all the weirdness, danger, and action. His only real lead was the stupid pin with an eye print and already confirmed in HQ that it was nothing more than an insignia to signify whoever was behind all of the kidnappings. Crow sighs and pulls out his phone. Seeing his nieces smiling in the background at least cheered him up slightly. He can only hope the brats weren't doing anything too dangerous. Putting the cigarette out, he lets out another sigh before heading back in the base he was currently at. Another STRQHQ somewhere on the southeast this time. Heading inside the high-tech shack, 
he grabs some weapons and supplies before grabbing the keys to a cab marine as Ruby once put it. But something felt wrong. He felt hairs behind his nape stand up and all of a sudden the room felt colder than usual. Eyes widening, he dodged to the left with a flip and landed on his knee as a bullet hit the wall where he stood just seconds earlier. When he looked up, he found three figures all clad in black. Now that it was closer, there was only one thing you could see. It was the bright neon green eyes, pupils, scleras, and all, that peeked out the masks that the trio wore. There were too many things running in his mind for this to make sense. No one should be able to track him. No one other than Glinda and Ajpin that is. Was the insignia more than just a pin after all? Was it a hidden tracker that no one knew about? Who the actual fuck were these guys? He wouldn't be able to think any more after that as the tallest of the figures began injecting something in their neck. Crow could only stare in abject horror as the black clad person slowly started lurching. Their muscles convulse as it slowly enlarges, getting wider and wider by the moment as it rips apart at the seams of their dark clothes. The other two smaller figures began walking out of the shack but he was too stunned to move. His legs felt like they were cemented down on the very ground he stood. Then, as if things couldn't get more bizarre, what happens next is straight out of a movie. Hirug. The hulking person literally roars before he launches towards Crow's direction, running at an impeccable speed for his frame, arms in front of his face like a bull readying to stab you with its horns. They almost instantly close the short gap between them. Slam. He feels strong forearms collide with his chest and he winces immediately as it makes contact. He definitely felt some ribs bruise and break but the hulking figure wasn't done yet. They grabbed Crow as easily as he was just some ragdoll and threw him so hard he broke through the wooden walls that made up the base. He rolled on the ground before hitting a tree trunk making him wince at the impact. Gasping, he tried getting up, pain erupting from every nerve ending in his body but before he could steady himself, one of the smaller figures grabbed him by his hair, pulling him backwards and aimed a sharp object directly on his neck. His breathing went shallow, eyes nearly succumbing to the aching everything he was going through right about this moment. His dizzying vision tries to focus on the only thing that was in front of him. The drugged up violent psycho who was once again readying to ram into him. Then he heard a loud buzzing, akin to electric currents passing and he vaguely saw the brawny person clutch something that was around his neck. It was an electric collar and as soon as the buzzing stopped, the figure fell on the ground face first. TCH, you oaf, you were only supposed to rough him up a bit, a voice speaks before they begin clapping, ah. Agent Branwen. A pleasant day to see you. The person said as they got closer and closer, Crow couldn't see who it was, he was already seeing double but he could faintly make out a lab coat wrapped around a thin frame, I do hope that wasn't too much. You're about to be one of our puppets after all. Can't have you unable to perform your tasks. The person said too much glee in their tone. I suppose you would like to know a great many things. Correct. But Crow couldn't focus on these words anymore, the ringing in his ears were getting louder, everything hurt and he regretted taking off his suit. The thing would have at least managed to catch some of that recoil and shielded him a bit. This could have been avoided if he was more careful. Too bad you won't get to find out, the person cackled, then he could somewhat make out a beeping sound before the figure walked a few feet away. Yes. I have him, a bit of a rough condition but you should have expected that. No, he's alone, we'll have to find the bratzo. Torchwick, Tisk. That son of a bitch got to them first? Well, terrific, you got all of them now who am I supposed to experiment on, the figure talked incautiously. As if they didn't care about who was listening. The person clicked their tongue again but continued listening, fine, just be ready to fit Agent Branwen. We're gonna need a tighter leash against this disobedient pet. Crow barely registers a beep before he notices the person standing in front of him, the figure in all black holding him by head momentarily letting go before he gets pulled closer by a man that looked every bit a mad scientist. From his red tinted glasses, his long lab coat, his spiky, messy white hair and beard and all the wrinkles that he got from laughing much too maniacally often, he assumes, the man looked evil as fuck. Don't worry agent, everything will be fine soon, the man whispers, smiling like the sick fuck he was, he pulls away and snaps his fingers, you too. Sedate him take him to what's for fitting, and welcome him with zeal, he'll be your new little brother. With a prick on his neck, he felt cold liquid seep into his veins, the last thing Crow could remember was the sound of evil laughter ringing in his ears. He blacked out with one thought. Ruby. Yang it was dark for who knows how long. 
Glenda didn't like this one bit. Ma'am Goodwitch. John Ark, a rookie agent, together with three other rookies, salutes as they stare at her with determined eyes. Team JNPR had been doing well recently despite mostly just taking missions as a three-man unit with Penny Polandina as a reliable intel and technician, but a mission like this. They were tasked to find a man named Roman Torchwick, a very elusive weapons trader who was suspected to deliver a large shipment of arms to Lord knows where and to be used for God knows what. No one has ever seen this man, no prior data, no profile within the W.P.O database. The man was so well versed in hiding nobody even knew what he looked like, currently the only thing she was basing her information on were rumors, and if there was one thing she knew about that, that kind of clue was useless more than half the time. Have you read the briefing? She asked and the team nodded slowly. We have, ma'am, Lyren answered curtly, but we do have questions. Name them. Well. One is, this is it. Nora Valkyrie questions with a tone of disbelief, eyebrows raised as her orb stared rereading the document in their hands. She understood the feeling. The only thing on the screen was the target's name and the objective, find Torchwick, gather intel, and eliminate if necessary. I uh, agree with Miss Valkyrie, ma'am, isn't this too, er, empty. John Ark questions, scratching the back of his neck awkwardly, where do we even begin? She could only shake her head and look at them solemnly, I'm sorry, this is all the information we have on this Torchwick person, you will have to find everything else yourself, she says before telling them to walk toward the white metal table that sat on the side of the room. On top of it, were four briefcases with the World Protection Order logo emblazoned on top with a small screen displaying each of their names, typically, we don't give rookies their own specified gear until they get promoted to agents but. I have a bad feeling about this mission, so please, use these well. The three agents gaped in awe as they all stared at their customized gear. Truth be told, she hadn't thought of giving them one, until a certain head of the engineering team approached her to give the kids the usual standard issued mission necessities and weapons but with certain twists. He called them transforming weapons, something he started pursuing at the behest of one Ruby Rose who was just as creative when it came to weapons design. John had gotten a plasma blade, which was just a kind of high-tech pommel that would erupt into a blade with the push of a button, it could also expand into a bulletproof shield through the sword's hilt. Which honestly, good which didn't understand. He was going to go up against people with guns but the boy really wanted a sword to go up against it. Ren on the other hand was more practical, two submachine guns that would transform into daggers to complete his quick and agile fighting style. Didn't deal the most damage but the boy was excellent at stealth, could slice anyone's throat before they would even notice. Nora Valkyrie on the other hand, went back to impractical. It reminded her of one of the old veterans who literally fought foes with a giant axe. The peach-haired girl sported a grenade launcher that could change into a giant warhammer that emitted electric shocks at the flat end, making sure anybody who gets near either gets flattened or electrocuted. She could already feel the enemy's pain. As the trio played with their newly acquired gear, there was one person who seemed to be in a world of her own. The only daughter of Pietro Polandino was focused on something on her tablet, eyes staring at whatever on her screen was with inquisitiveness until Goodwitch called her attention. Penny, are you alright? She asked and the girl looked surprised. She looked around the room in confusion before letting her green eyes land on Glinda. Oh right? We were conferring, she says astonished, terribly sorry, ma'am Goodwitch, I was preoccupied with something. What would be so important that you went here almost dazed and inattentive during a mission briefing? The girl's eyes darted almost nervously before sighing in surrender, I'm sorry ma'am, I know we were technically supposed to not contact Ruby and Yang but it seems they found something of great import. She raised a brow at the statement and walked towards the girl, what is this item you speak of? Then Penny flipped the tablet and immediately she felt her blood run cold. It was a picture of the same pin Crow had asked to learn about. She tried her best to find the significance of it towards the missing agent's case but it seemed nothing more than an insignia, just a metal pin with decorations. How long have they had it? Just a couple of days ago from what I gather, Ruby said she just found it somewhere, the exact nature of this somewhere remains unknown, the girl explains briefly, is there something wrong, ma'am? Goodwitch's brow furrows further as she pulls out her phone from her pocket, quickly dialing Crow's device. She rang him over and over again but received no answers whatsoever. The simple act of not answering calls had her heart rate spiking. Crow knew better than to ignore her calls after all, no matter what the situation, he always responded to her. 
She didn't like this anymore. She needed to get to the bottom of things. She lets out a breath she'd been holding and stares at the orange-haired girl seriously, Penny, listen to me, I need JNPR to go to the sisters, I don't know why but I feel like they're already wrapped up in this, she takes off her bracelet and locks it on the girl's wrist, I know they're on provision but if they know anything about this. I'm gonna need the six of you to find out and put a stop to whatever evil the enemy is planning, alright. She tries to calm her loudly beating heart, Ark, Lie, Valkyrie, you three, follow Penny's lead, understand. Do not take the bracelet off, it's a surefire way for me to find you kids no matter where you are. John raises an arm up, but what about but she had already cut him off. Penny will brief you on the jet and, above all, be safe, understand. The four would-be agents nodded seriously before grabbing their gear and ready to be suited up. The orange-haired girl gave her one last look filled with worry and uncertainty but good which could only offer a solemn nod. As the kids left, she also had one mission. Find Crow Branwen, who most likely became the latest victim of disappearances that plagued their organization. Well, his lifeline hasn't reached the red so that hasn't alerted Ajpin as of yet, which means he was at the very least, he was still alive. She just needed to hurry to keep it that way. Quickly scouring the database, she found the last place he was staying at. STRQ Base 21. Glinda can only hope she'd find clues that would aid in her search. Has Penny found anything yet? Yang tapped her foot impatiently, there has to be something. An answer or anything. Ugh. Yang. Please. I'm trying to think and your bellyaching isn't helping. Ruby couldn't help but reply snappily. Currently they were in their basement, surrounded by everything one could ever need to go on a mission, they even have two protective suits, the one used by official agents on the field on display just in case they need it. And with the way things are going, they might need to don that suit pretty soon. When they got home that day, she immediately showed Yang the pin and to her biggest surprise, her sister practically sprinted for her room, items being thrown haphazardly everywhere until she heard hurried, heavy footprints making a sprint downstairs. Yang places another similar looking pin but this one had orange flames as a design instead of a singular, onyx eye and the gears on Ruby's head started turning. Yang had told her that she found it pinned on Adam Taurus collar and she just pulled it out of curiosity, kept it and forgot about it up until this moment. Save for the design, the two items were almost similar, weight, width, height. So Ruby's thoughts immediately go to one conclusion. These things were probably connected. But how? Well that part was still lost to her but she was determined to know. That was why she commissioned Penny in on this. But just like them, Penny was just as clueless as to the significance of the pin so she had spent the past few days almost locked up in the basement scouring everywhere about it, alongside the man that set the building on fire. Both coming up empty, empty, empty. She was getting pissed. Her eyes hurt, her back hurt and she couldn't help but feel tense. Like that feeling where you're preparing for something to happen, Heck, you're already prepared but you still feel like you won't be able to avoid an impending disaster. All in all, she was tired and shaken and she'd been at this for literal days. She also hadn't talked to Weiss much since that day and it was adding to her stress. Everything was going wrong and she didn't know how to fix it. Fuck, she slams a hand on the table pinching the bridge of her nose before running a hand on her unruly hair. She's been at this for too long and she was in a slump. The two months of doing nothing but school was dulling her brain's ability to solve problems. What if it also affected her skills as an agent? She feels Yang's hand placed on her shoulders, gently patting it as her sister gives her an apologetic smile, sorry. I didn't mean to pressure you. Ruby lets out a sigh before smiling forcibly, it's okay. I'm sorry too, nothing is popping up and it's pissing me off, suddenly, their attention gets interrupted as the monitor of her laptop changes displays. It was Robert. Miss Yang. Miss Ruby, he says with a usual kind smile. Good day Robert, she answers back with a tired, somewhat forced smile. Because she was just literally forcing herself awake for the past, two, probably days. How long has she been in the basement? I know you two are resting but it seems you have guests over, quite a number of them too. I shall be sending them up front. She shares a confused look with Yang and she could already feel something stirring up in her stomach. It was nothing pleasant. Yang pulls her up as they go up to the ground floor, closing the basement entrance that was hidden behind an unsuspecting bookshelf. 
a classic house gimmick for a special agent which she honestly would appreciate more had she not been this tired. They passed by a couple of mirrors and she saw herself for the first time in days. Ruby looked horrible, honestly. Her hair was a nest, she had stains on her shirt from something she ate probably a couple of days ago. Her eyes were bloodshot and the bags beneath were dark and heavy. So much for impressing Weiss. She looked like dog shit. She didn't even have enough time to fix herself up because Yang had already opened the door and let two different groups inside their home. One was, of course, their school friends, innocents, civilians. The other half was, definitely not a group she expected to mingle with the so-called civvies. You two were holding out on us. Nora exclaimed, grinning as she stared at everything with awe and her eyes went to stare at the rest of the group, mouth slightly ajar. Penny was smiling shyly, John was waving awkwardly and Ren bowed ever so slightly, face impassive as he kept a tight grip on one Nora Valkyrie's collar whose legs were already itching to explore the place. Just the shock of having her fragments of her double life coincide without warning plus her very sleep deprived self had her feeling dizzy. The woozy getting groovy in her brain made her knees buckle and the last thing she remembers was a chorus of surprised gasps and her sister shaking her to wake up. Let the tense sleepover begin. Chapter 14, Worlds Colliding are you sure about this? Blake asks skeptically and Weiss just sighs for the umpteenth time. Currently they were both in Weiss' bedroom talking about the upcoming sleepover and how it might all boil down to. Yes, I'm very sure about this, Belladonna, now are you in or not, the white-haired girl huffs in frustration, Man, aren't you the least bit curious? Of course I am, but to spy on our best friends. The girls we're practically in love with. Blake raises a brow to further raise a point, I get that the, burning building stunt was shocking but isn't there a slight chance you're just majorly overthinking this? Maybe so but you didn't see Ruby's eyes back then, she frowns and looks away, they were so, cold. Blake. And I just need to know if they're the same people they say they are, or my mind's never going to be at ease. Blake stared at her for a good moment before exhaling a deep breath and nodding, fine. I agree, but how do you propose we go about this? Just sneak around when they're all asleep. The more Weiss thought about it, the less sure she was about the whole thing, but her gut was telling her there was serious afoot and, she'd always been inquisitive, yes. That's what we do, but we have to be very careful, we can't let Coco, Hira and Vel be dragged into this and we sure as hell can't let Ruby and Yang know. Blake nods seriously before asking, what are we supposed to be looking for anyway? Anything that might suggest that they're not as clean as we thought, or anything too conclusive that'll point out anything illegal they're doing, she says grimly which makes her black-haired friend hum. Then the million-dollar question came, and what'll we do if we do find something out, what'll happen then? Weiss could only sigh before flipping herself upright, staring at her bedroom ceiling, I don't know. I just want the truth for now. What comes after it? They'll have to deal with one step at a time. She was aware that her jaw was probably dropped halfway down but as she stared at the white electric gate, Weiss couldn't help but gape some more. Her friends had the same reaction to it. Did you two know your Romeo lets were this loaded? Coco asked a guest. Honestly, she had the same reaction. She expected maybe something similar to the modest sized home they used to visit as kids. Not a guarded estate similar to the one her family owned. Now, more than ever, her theory about the sisters being involved in some sort of organized crime stuck a bit more. Seriously, how did two girls come upon this amount of money without doing something, morally dubious? Were they killers for hire or something? Was it really possible for her sweet, adorable dolt, Ruby Rose to commit such acts? From beside her, she could see the cogs on Blake's brain turning. Trying to figure everything out but before they could continue, they were interrupted by the multiple sounds of feet just behind her car. Voices too. Ugh, a 12-hour flight wasn't enough, now we have to walk up a hill. One voice said, whining, seriously, no one said anything about bringing a car or something. A vehicle, would have been helpful, especially with the amount of equipment we're hauling, another said, it was a girl. Oakman. It's only like a couple of hundred feet away. Plus, it'll give you enough of a workout to improve your lankiness Johnny, another girl said energetically. Easy for you to say. You're half Amazon. I don't have your physical strength. The first voice replied. Guys, if we could just please oh, we're here, a final voice says and soon they were face to face with a group of four, wearing casual clothing, 
holding identical briefcases and lots of luggage. One was a tall blonde boy with spiky hair, his forehead had beads of sweat dripping down the sides of his face. Next to him was a girl with wavy orange hair tied up to a ponytail, similarly looking somewhat frazzled but not as much as the first boy. Behind them was a girl with short, peach hair, smiling as if the giant load she was carrying behind her weighed nothing and lastly was another guy with long dark, spiky hair, he too, seemed very unfazed over the weight he was carrying behind him. Oh crap, did we actually go to the wrong place, the peach haired girl says with confusion. This is the address Glinda sent us to, the orange haired girl replied, I don't think we'd get that wrong. Please. I'm begging you, don't make me go down the hill, please the blonde boy slumped before sighing. Awkward silence envelops the two groups who were left staring at each other until a man approached them riding a motorcycle wearing a full security guard uniform. He takes off his helmet and they all turn towards him. Oh my! What a crowd, didn't expect this much this early. No one ever visits here, he says with a smile before going down his motorcycle, good day to you, ladies and gents, name's Robert, the guard of this fine place, how may I assist? It was Pira who spoke up for all of them, good day to you too, Robert, we're here as Ruby and Yang's guests, classmates, have they failed to mention our arrival? Miss Rose and Miss Yao Longs. I haven't been able to talk to them the past few days, they've been cooped inside the house resting but I'll go ring them up for you guys to enter. He smiles and walks inside the guardhouse just a few feet away from the main gate, and soon they were stuck with another tense silence between them. They didn't leave when Robert mentioned Ruby and Yang so they definitely know each other, but how were they connected to the sisters? They seemed like normal kids their age but, somehow she couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about them too. A few moments from that thought, Robert emerges with a smile, hello once again everyone, Miss Ruby and Miss Yang will be greeting you at the front, please do come in, enjoy your stay and I will be parking your vehicle, Miss. There were so many thoughts running in her head so she only noticed that the pleasant man was referring to her after Blake elbowed her side, Oh, yes, thank you, Robert, my name is Weiss, pleased to meet your acquaintance, she said almost automatically, those years of etiquette kicking in instantaneously. Excellent, Miss Weiss and company, please do follow me. She thought the electric gate was enough of a sign but when they got inside and saw the meticulously designed lawn, water fountain and the three-floor modern mansion, she couldn't help but feel daunted. Which was absurd, the Shni estate was bigger than this but, this was owned by Ruby and Yang themselves. She still had a hard time grasping the fact that childhood dorks were this well off all of a sudden. She hears one whistle loudly as they also stare at the building and Velvet shaking her head beside them, they act so, normal though. Ah yes, Miss Ruby and Miss Yang sure are a breath of fresh air, they don't act the least like those pompous, rich snobs I used to work for, Robert laughs, Miss Ruby even gives me breakfast she cooks every day since the first day they lived here. See, that sounded more like kind, caring Ruby, always thinking of others, then why can't she just stop, she was kind, sweet, loving, the perfect girlfriend honestly, but there was something else, she can't stop until she knows. Here we are ladies and gents, I do hope you'll enjoy your stay. Robert tips his hat before walking off, leaving them alone. It was the blonde boy who spoke to them first, so uh, do you guys want to ring the doorbell? Or? Before they could answer the query, the huge, wooden, side-by-side -side door opens revealing a somewhat tired-looking Yang, giving them an awkward smile. Her eyes darted towards their group first before landing on the other group of four. Was it just her or, did Yang look scared? Before they could see her expression fully, she bows and leads them inside with a half-smile half-grimace. The house was just as impressive, if not more so. But honestly, she didn't care about the building, the only thing holding her attention right now was the other girl who owned half the house. Her wonderfully sweet Rose. For the first time though, Ruby lacked any sort of care she usually put in her appearance. She wore loose basketball shorts, her feet were bare and she was wearing a plain red shirt with some sort of stain around her midriff. Her hair was greasy and the bags around her eyes were the darkest she'd ever seen them. She loved Ruby, despite everything. But holy crap, the girl looked like she hadn't slept in days. Heck, she probably hasn't showered in days too. Ruby's eyes however, weren't focused on them, they were trained on the group of four beside them. Before she could say anything though, she was beaten by the excited girl with peach colored hair, you two were holding out on us, she exclaimed and she could see panic flash in those silver eyes. Then slowly, 
Ruby became unsteady. Her eyes rolled to the back of her head and she started falling backwards. All caught in surprise, she could only gasp, unable to move her legs to catch her lady love. Luckily, they could always count on Yang to catch her little sister when she was in a tumble. What happened to her, the girl with orange said walking past them and kneeling beside Ruby. The girl placed a hand on Ruby's forehead and looked at Yang with worry. Something inside her twinged as she saw the act. This girl did it with ease that it felt like she'd done it dozens of times before. Weiss didn't like it one bit. Don't worry guys. Yang says cheerfully, much so that it just sounded awkward, it's just sleep deprivation, let's just let Rubes rest for a bit and, the golden haired girl's eyes dart on each one of them before sighing, why don't we go inside and I'll introduce you guys, yeah. Yang was fucked. Fuck twice no ten times. Over. Shit. She tried to play it off but JNPR arriving was just, too out of the fucking blue. Seriously. She wasn't known for her damn delicate speaking skills. Yang had always relied on Ruby for the talking parts. Negotiations, investigations, she'd always been more on the punch first, questions later approach. Now her sister was down and out and she had no way of talking themselves out of this. The air was tense as she led them further in, their first stop was the living room which was, a rightful mess to be honest. They had been busy the past few days and the sleepover had somewhat slipped their minds. They were supposed to clean the place up a bit but, by the messy state of the makeshift beds that were the couch. Multiple pillows thrown on the floor, blankets unmade. They weren't ready to do this at all. So, uh. Sorry for the mess, she chuckles awkwardly, I'll uh, place Ruby there to sleep whilst giving you guys a tour. You're not going to put Ruby in her room. Velvet asks. Followed by one Coco Adele, and introduce us to your other visitors. We don't sleep in our rooms, too far and oh right? Introductions, she chuckles awkwardly, turning away from them to place Ruby slowly on the couch. Giving her probably some additional seconds to come up with something also somewhat nudging Ruby to wake her up or something. Both failed. The excuse and waking Ruby up. Internally sighing, she once again faced the two groups of people who weren't supposed to meet. Here it goes. So, school friends. Meet mine and Ruby's non-school friends, she forcefully grins brightly, slinging an arm over John and Nora, this Nora Valkyrie and John Ark and those two she points at the remaining pair, that's Penny Polandina and Lyran. Then the four gave them varying levels of greetings. John was awkward, Penny was somewhat shy, Ren was impassive as always and Nora was bubbly as heck. Multiple nice to meet yous were exchanged and as that happened, she slowly pulls John backward, using the three as cover and whispers to his ear discreetly but panic was written all over her lilac eyes, what the actual fuck is going on, John. And the boy looked just as lost to be honest, we don't know either, we got sent to find this mystery weapons dealer and good which suspects you're already in a mess. We're literally just trying to live a normal. What are you two talking about? Blake asks from across them and the blonde pair immediately stood upright. Oh. John was just nervous to be in front of so many beautiful ladies, am I right, Johnny boy? I know I do, she grins and elbows John's side. Which she reckons was stronger than she intended cause the boy nearly toppled over. He managed to stay upright so at least she knew he'd been training a lot better since they'd left. Are all right. The boy only answers nervously, I I I am John Ark, N N N nice to meet you, he says, shakily sticking his hand out, the nearest person to him was their red-headed friend, Pira who was too polite to refuse the handshake. Nice to meet you too John, I'm Pira Nikos, these are my friends, Coco Adele, Velvet Scarlatina, Blake Belladonna, and Weishni. For a moment the boy seemed stunned as Pira shook his hand, when he finally found his voice, his stuttering was worse than before, oh. Gggre at to me meet why why you pretty er. Pira. I meant Pira. Then he pulled his hand away abruptly and began scratching the back of his head awkwardly, his neck was reddening awfully quickly and his face looked like he was just cooked in a sauna, the boy then sighs dejectedly, I'm just. I'm just gonna shut my mouth now. By the gods above, Yang wanted to bury her head from all the second-hand embarrassment but all in all, Pira didn't seem to mind, in fact. The red-headed girl seemed to have a similar tinge of crimson after John's greeting. If this was any other time, she probably would have relished this realization by teasing the hell out of the pair but, now was not the time for tomfoolery. Sheesh, she sounded like such a glinda. The next one who asked was surprisingly, her Blakey, 
so, how did you guys meet? That one was a real kicker ain't it? So much so that the group of agents found themselves looking at each other for answers. Fuck, this would have been a lot easier if Ruby wasn't decommissioned at the moment. She'd be able to come up with a believable story, something that the five of them could easily back up. They couldn't just tell civilians, much less their almost significant, significant others that, oh, we work for the secret organization who saves the world a couple of times a year, we're also highly trained operatives meant to kill dangerous scum, heck my kill counts already in the hundreds, and get away with it, right? Then she sees a mischievous glint in Nora's eyes, accompanied by an equally playful smile that had her quaking in her boots, oh that's easy, where before she could finish the statement, Ren's hand practically flew in her mouth to cover it. Even the usually straight-faced boy seemed more rattled than she'd ever seen him, orphans, he murmured. Weiss, who was the quietest this whole time, raises a brow at his answer, what? We're, orphans, Ren answers carefully. Then silence covers their group again. Yep, they were fucked. So fucked. Until Penny, bless her soul, clasps her hands and gleefully proclaims, yes, that's right. We're orphans that became adoptive siblings, she smiles innocently despite telling an outrageously believable lie. Why yet? We kept our last names from our original families but we're adoptive siblings, John says, stuttering less than earlier, we are. That was when Yang decided to pick up the story, they met us through Uncle Crow's job, their adoptive mom, Glinda, she works with our uncle, we met when she brought them to work and we've bonded since then, got close over the years. Yeah. Glinda's the best. Nora looked like she was just a few seconds away from bursting into obnoxious giggles. Oh, Weiss murmurs, skeptically, how come you've never mentioned them before? Never got the chance to, to be honest, we sure as heck didn't expect a surprise visit all of a sudden, she tried not to let the tightness of the statement show, JNPR still had a lot to answer for but for now she was just glad she was already adapting to the unexpected events. Now it was only a matter of informing Ruby about their backstory and hoping they find a solution to whatever problems they were going to be facing in the probable upcoming days. She didn't like this one bit. Serial arsonist who knew them, JNP are looking for a mysterious weapons dealer, Glinda thinking they were already involved and come to think of it, they hadn't heard from Uncle Crow in a long while. His last message was over three weeks ago and it was just a simple mission might take longer, love ya kiddos, miss you both. Something in her gut told her they were going to be facing a problem, a big problem, real soon. Ruby really needed to wake up. Yang desperately needed backup. For now, all she can do is stall. Stall like hell and hope this doesn't bite them in the ass. They had to be more careful too. Or risk dragging Blakey and Weiss, along with their normal friends in this. Fuck, why was this so much more complicated than actually doing agent work? She could only hold back and sigh and grin brightly, hoping the smile reaches her eyes and that their childhood best friends don't notice anything odd, now, who's up for a tour? When Glinda Goodwitch arrived in STRQ Base 21, she couldn't help but be shocked. The place was a mess to put it lightly. The typical shack that hid most of their gear was trashed in the upper half with a gaping wall on one side that looked like it was rammed by a wrecking ball, oddly enough there doesn't seem to be anything amiss on the inner chambers of the base where the gadgets are. The outside though didn't fare any better, the ground was covered in multiple different footprints and scuffs so clearly there was a fight that took place. Upon inspecting, she noticed at least five different boot sizes imprinted on the ground, so the minimum number of people to expect was five, including Crow most likely, unless a lot of people wore the same boot size. To summarize, a group came here, didn't take anything, instead just their agent, Crow Branwen. That could only mean her theory was right. He was the next victim on this long line of missing agent cases. This was getting worse and worse. Sighing, she ran her hand through her platinum blonde locks in frustration. She didn't go out in the field as much as she used to but every time she did, the sense of foreboding and fear never went away. Now what? This is a dead end, she couldn't help but mumble, when her eyes flitted downwards, she found a curious looking syringe. She picked it up and saw there was some sort of green liquid as residue in the bottom. Then just a few feet from that was Crow's phone somewhat hidden in the underbrush. They surprised him, never saw them coming, she thought as she opened their agent's device. At least it was unlocked, which allowed for her easy access. Inside was a picture of the three of them, Ruby, Yang and Crow looking happily at the camera. Oh gods, 
how was she going to explain to the girls that their uncle was kidnapped by a hidden enemy, probably being tortured and who knows what. She'd grown to care for the kids over the years. Hell, even Crow Branwen had once asked her to take care over those troublemakers if he ever kicks the bucket due to this hazardous job. But. Glinda probably won't be able to deliver that kind of blow to two kids who've lost so much. No. Not yet. If there was anyone as resilient as a damn cockroach, it was Crow who fought against terrifying odds time and time again, and if they took him, chances are he'd be kept alive until they get whatever they want from him. Her time window was until his lifeline turns red. She was going to find him. No matter what. The big question was how. Glinda needed to be an agent today. Not just a handler, someone who supervises missions. No more distractions. She opens Crow's phone again searching through everything. Surprisingly, she found a way through Branwen's damn notepad. Amidst the lines of copy-pasted codes, important work stuff were his own reminders. Grocery lists, to-do lists. One item on said to-do list managed to catch her attention. Tell Ruby and Yang how to use the molar trackers, might come in handy one day. Seriously, a molar chip of all things. It was this tiny device that would be drilled in the back of their jaws. They stopped using it because it was too painful to install and very old school but it seems like their best agent had other plans. Did Crow even tell the girls that they had trackers directly implanted in their bodies? Honestly that man. She really had to tell him off for being so sloppy with devices that had international secrets in them. But right now she was thankful for his stupidity. The trackers might have been an old thing but you couldn't deny the accuracy and effectiveness of it. She types in the code in the Find My Tracker app in Crow's phone and immediately she gets a hit. The longitude and latitude showed up and just when she thought she knew what she was doing, she met with another question. Why the hell was Crow in the middle of the damn South Atlantic Ocean? Alright, that's where we'll leave off for the day. Thanks so much for listening along with me today. If you enjoyed please like and comment down below. It really helps with the algorithms. I look forward to seeing you next time. Ciao for now lovelies.